Hey, smokers and jokers. Dan Sharp here, host of the Smoke Pit Podcast. This week we had a call-in from an awesome guest, Tim Kennedy. He was a top UFC fighter, Green Beret sniper, hosts his own TV show uh, called Hunting Hitler on the History Channel. And unfortunately, he couldn't come to the studio, but we were able to get him to call in. So I do apologize if the audio is uh, a little less than what you're used to. Please bear with us. I promise next week will be better. But in the meantime, check out our sponsors, Combat Home Over. They have awesome hair products, beard oils, pomades. Use our discount code CREAMPIE to save money, combatcomeover.com. Also, Strike Force Energy, uh, liquid energy packets that go in your beer, your water, whatever the hell you want to put it in. Save money on that by using our discount code SMOKEPIT on their website, strikeforceenergy.com. As well as check out victoralphaclothing.com and their social media. A fantastic veteran apparel line that gives back to the veteran community. Please enjoy this week's episode and send us back any feedback you have from it, any of the questions we ask, and thank you again for bearing with us. Welcome to this very special episode of The Smoke Pit. We have a fantastic guest today, Tim Kennedy, joining us. How are you doing today? Dude, I'm awesome. Yeah, so uh, for, for, for those of you who don't already know who Tim is, correct yourself. Uh, he is a special forces sniper, uh, pro MMA fighter, movie star, author, TV show uh, host, just just about everything. It's a lot of stuff when you like put it all together. You're like this guy has mental problems. That's what that's that's what that sounds like. Yeah, and uh, in addition to that, you also teach uh, self defense courses and uh, advocates for uh, the the right type of masculinity. I, be- I believe in men being men and women being men- women, if that is a thing. <laughs> that sounds weird that we have to define that, but whatever. Yeah, we, uh, we had an episode where we talked about how things were simpler back in like the pioneer days. You know, men were really men and, you know, boys were men and women were men and babies were men and everybody drank coffee black and killed <laughs> rattlesnakes. All right. So we um, got a few topics I'd like to cover. Uh, so uh, we both... Uh, a little bit of uh, pooping and snooping and some of the same shitholes. Uh, so what would you say as far as Iraq and Afghanistan, how, how do you feel they differ in your opinion as far as like the enemy, civilians, campaign objectives? Because I always like to ask that question to, to guys who've been to multiple theaters because a lot of times they get lumped into the same thing, but they were very different. You know, first they're like different campaigns uh, and the approach to defeating both enemies while they shared a lot lot of similarities from they were both radical extreme islam crazy terrorists uh that's about where the similarities ended their approach i mean they had ttps that that were both in iraq and afghanistan or obviously ieds and um you know like sawing people's heads off or setting them on fire but the way that we had to fight them was way different you know uh, iraq you know like the by with and through um was I was working with the ICTF, like the, the Iraqi counterterrorism force. Yeah. Um, so we were trying to train Iraqis to run a, a democratic government mm-hmm. and, um, you know, fight their own war. And we're trying to weed out prior Al Qaeda uh, strongholds. Um, what we're in Afghanistan, you know, we're fighting an ideology. You know, we're, we're trying to stop them from being able to recruit and train future terrorists that would come over and try and do this harm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, uh, I got to Iraq in 05, and it was still kind of like uh, the wild, wild west, the triangle of death. You know, anyone oh, out good times. Time. Yeah, you know, it was, <laughs> was, was free range. And then I, I went back to Iraq in 07, and that was more like standing up police stations and uh, doing... Uh, Intel driven raids and and stuff like that, and then I didn't get over to Afghanistan until um, 2011, and by that point the majority of the the large scale fighting was done, and it was just uh, insurgency setting in IEDs, and it almost kind of seemed pointless to be there because we weren't actually really contributing too much to like a bigger effort. We were just trying not to get our legs blown off on a daily yeah, basis. Yeah, and, I, uh, yeah, I want to keep my legs. <laughs> I was embedded with a. Uh, a training team where it was like eight of us and 45 Afghans 
uh, yeah, out of the middle of nowhere. And we were just there to call EOD when we found an IED or to call in the nine line when we took a casualty. And I was like, man, I didn't sign up for this. Like, this is, <laughs> you know, this is some fucking SF shit, you know, like, I just, yeah. I just want to be pointing in the direction of a city and attack it. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the um, we didn't get to choose what we signed up for, you know? Like, we just signed up, and, and whatever they tell us to do is what we're going to do. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes a hard road to hoe, but we're going to do it. That's why we got the flag on our shoulder. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic point. So transitioning into uh, just basically being do, uh, doing what you're told, uh, everybody goes through some sort of, of a military combative program. You know, the army has theirs, uh, the Marine Corps has theirs. Uh, how does that, uh, translate to your pro fighting experience? Would you say the program is good as is, or would you re- make any recommendations? They're kind of getting dorky now. You know, if you kind of go back to the 2007, 2008 timeframe where it was, I mean, f- fighting's fighting. You know, you, you give me a gun, I'm a violent dude. You, you yeah. give me a pool cue, I'm a violent dude. Um, you know, you like, you, you, you drop me off in the middle of the desert and I'm surrounded by velociraptors that, you know, need some food. I'm a violent dude, you know? So uh, when I say they're getting dorky is training somebody how to be violent isn't a nerdy thing. You know, it's not like, all right, we're going to, um, we're going to go in here and we're going to like, no, man, like. You let people sweat, you let people bleed, you have good instruction on how to build fundamentals of fighting, and you let them be warriors, because you got to do warrior shit when you're sending warriors over to do warrior shit. And you know, when when you have like four stars and three stars getting in there and start dictating um, what kind of elements and, and POIs, points of instruction should be included and not warriors, then you have problems. Like when people's agendas are being pushed from the Pentagon down into the small unit, it's like, how, how about we just show them how to be warriors? Yep. We let them be warriors. And then we go and do the work that you want us to do. So if anything's going to change, I'd be like, Hey brass, get out of warrior stuff. Because when you're, when you're, when you're like wearing your class A's all day long, like, what are they call them? Like the ACUs now? I don't know. Like the dress uniforms. When you're wearing like your dress up stuff every single day to work, you have forgot what it's like to be a warrior, right? Yeah. So how about you let the dudes that are bleeding every single day and going over and killing people all the time, how about you let those guys decide what it's supposed to look like to be a warrior? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I did some amateur boxing before I, I went in. And, you know, most of my knockouts were, you know, uh, either hooks or uppercuts to the head. And then I get to boot camp in 2004 and they're like, all right, we're going to box, but you can't punch the other guy in the head. And I was like, okay, like I, I get it to an extent, like you don't need anybody getting a concussion, but it was just so canned where like, how are you supposed to box somebody when you can only p- punch them in like the strikeout zone, you know, like it was just, it was so canned and, and so lame. And then yeah, as you get higher in the, the, ba- uh, the, the belt ranks and stuff and yeah, some of the training gets cooler, but I remember one day we spent six hours working on basic risk come alongs. And like, I have never seen a single person in any sort of combative sports ever tap out to that. You spend your first uh, four hours of your first day in boot camp learning how to fall. And it's like, okay, I get it to an extent, but I, I feel like there needs to be more practical application um, as far as, like you said, like let guys get in there, let them beat each other up, let them, let them feel what it's like to be punched in the liver or, you know, take a, you know, take a, a good shot to the nose. But you have a lot of these guys who go through with the Hollywood martial arts is, is what we call it, where it looks good on paper, but you know, um, if you actually get into a bar fight, it's not what you're actually trying to use. You, you got to like instill, speaking of bar fight, you know, it's, it's not a guy that's going to look to do a wrist lock. It's a guy that's going to look around the room and be like, oh, I'm going to stab this dude with this pool cue, Yeah. you know, and like that bar stool, I'm going to hit that dude over there with the bar stool, you know, and like, hey, that chandelier. I'm going to put it over that dude's head. You know, like <laughs> you figure it out when you tell, when you show somebody how to be tough and you, and you make people do tough things, they get tough and tough is a kind of a necessity of war. Oh yeah. Pain retains. And one of the, uh, the, the best exercise I did is going for the black belt and wrinkle martial arts. And they, uh, they spray the ground with OC and they make you do like odd number fightings, like uh, five on three or two on one. And the point of this is that you get the shit kicked out of you and you realize like you're not invincible. 
you're not Superman. Um, if you don't take the appropriate actions, you will lose fights. You kind of have to learn how to circle your opponents and, you know, do, do your best to try to shape the environment to your will and overcome obstacles. But like you said, like this dude is going to be like, all right, I'm going to execute this, uh, you know, the, this nice Marine Corps hip throw. And the other dude breaks a whiskey glass over his head. And it's like, they don't train you for that. But I think at, at some point in time, we should just uh, head out to Texas and rent out like a film lot and just film like a Western video of just like no no lyrics or dialogue or anything, just a bar fight. Like just us kicking the shit out of each other, getting thrown yeah. through windows. I'm down. <laughs> yeah, I think I know that, some bars that will let us do it too. I, I always wanted to do that, like uh, put like a sugar gas pain uh, panel in like um, a restaurant, and then do something with like you know if you have like a, a girlfriend or whatever the case may be, you're sitting there at a table and you hire some actress to come up and be like, who is she? And your girlfriend looks at you and you just flip the table, jump through the window, and just run and just record her reaction. That does sound funny. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be a girlfriend because the wife will divorce you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of getting beat up, um, our my co-host, Mike Sensi, he's, uh, he's not here right now because uh, he's still active duty, but he's in the Navy and he's jump walled and he, uh, he's got his wings from the Army and he, uh, he wanted to know... Uh, what was your roughest parachute landing? Static line? Uh, yeah, either that or Halo. Uh, man, I've been in the trees a bit. So <laughs> what they do is, you know, like the more senior or more tough or more jumps you have, they usually put you on like the first stick in the first couple of jumpers. So what you become is essentially a weather balloon <laughs> for the rest of the jumpers. So they're like, all right, Tim and Pete, they were a mile and a half into the trees. Let's move our drop point, our release point, a mile and a half to the west. You know, they're like, all the while, Tim and Pete are in the trees, and we have to walk a mile and a half with their parachutes. Um, uh, I was with my buddy Dave Hall and Peter Abara, and we were doing a, we were doing a jump in Elgin, Texas, and it's it's like a a, a rectangle drop zone that the wind was running perpendicular to the length. And um, yeah, we pretty much ended up like a mile and a half out into the trees. Um, I ended up in a bunch of cactus and I had to do like the full Uh hop your release and climb down your own reserve. And Pete got, because he like broke most of these pine trees until, who was the guy? Oh, Vlad the Impaler, where he'd like, take impaling device and like stick it through somebody's butthole. Um, <laughs> that's essentially what happened to Peter. Oh, and no. then when I finally found Dave Hall, um, he didn't want to pop his re- reserve. So he just like hung out in the trees and he was just swinging back and forth, like in recreational, like I'm just on a swing set with Taking my kids. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what are you doing, Dave? He's like, I'm swinging. I'm like, I see that. Is there a reason that you're swinging? He's like, because it's hot out here and I wanted some wind to flow. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that was, I don't know. That's pretty normal though in my life now. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, um, I, I, I can thankfully say that I, um, I, I never had to, to do anything like that. I did some skydiving on my own, but I landed on my ass and I was like, oh, I've had enough of that. Maybe yeah. I'm going to try again one day. Uh, he also, this isn't a bad place to land. Yeah, there's worse things. Yeah. There's, there's worse Your head. Things. <laughs> my uh my co-host was asked to be on uh naked and afraid uh he i want to know what advice would you give him going on the show with no outdoor survival skills being on beyond basic military training so i i think everybody takes a wrong approach to naked and afraid you know i think um they're always thinking about just surviving um i think i would are, i've never seen the show can you like find the other contestants and kill them is that an option <laughs> uh no they uh they generally put one guy and one girl and uh they leave you out there for x amount of time and then once you're all eaten up by bugs and hate each other then they come get you oh so there's no like i thought isn't it a competition though um no i i think if you were on it it'd probably be naked and angry uh instead yeah. of afraid yeah um isn't there like, like you could I would use my prison pocket and I would smuggle in a lot of things that you're not supposed to have. Um, yeah. You know, like bottles of bourbon. Um, <laughs> what? I, I could get it to fit. I mean, well, en- I enough, think- enough CLP and you can get anything to fit. Oh yeah. 
I've, uh, I've followed your career enough to know that if you put your mind to something. Yeah. The other thing you should know is I make a lot of bad decisions and um, lubing up a bottle of CLP and trying to like, and so I could smuggle it in uh, to naked and afraid. Yeah. I don't know. Um, what if you just like started violently assaulting the production team <laughs> oh. in, in like a cannibalistic way, you know, it's like, Oh, Hey, you're a cameraman. I'm going to eat your leg. And then you trap them, you cuff them, you tie them up with like some hemp that you got off of, you know, some bark. And, um, and then you, you your pull out, enough. yeah. Yeah. And then you start like chopping the dude's leg off. I mean, they're going to intervene. And then that's yet another person that you can eat. Yeah. And they probably won't invite you to the reunion show, but then you sh- you show up anyways and eat everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like this. Now we're on the same page. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, has, has there ever, um, cause I, we, we know that you, uh, you know, you had a fantastic show on the history channel. Uh, would, would you tell our listeners a little bit about that? I just went around the world looking for Nazis. I mean, I felt I, I went and found old Nazis and then I went and found younger Nazis. And what we tried to show was that Nazis could have gotten out of, out of Germany during and after world war II, yeah. And if those Nazis could have gotten out. Maybe the Nazis to rule all Nazis, Hitler could have also gotten out. Uh-huh. So we followed the past of these, these assholes like Joseph Mengele and Skorzenski Um and uh, these are like super bad dudes, dudes that I wish were alive so that I could kill them again. And then eat them. But, no, I don't think I would want them in my body in any way. I don't know. I would you just know? drink so much bourbon that I throw it up. And so it's like, I didn't even use the meat. I just wasted it. Ah, that's, see, that's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, I'm going to set you on fire and then pee on you. But not because I want to put the fire out. It's just so I can set you on fire again. Yeah. You know, like that, that's how much I didn't like these guys. Um, and the, on account of the amount of bourbon I've drank, my, my urine is flammable. And so that's just an uh, experiment. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> you set them on fire and then they, they see you whip, whip your dick out and they're like, yes, he's going to, he's going to put me out. And then you piss on them and then they start burning hotter. Yep. It'd be so confusing. And like, that would be a great thing to do to these guys. And then congratulations. You also have chlamydia now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, they would actually. Yeah, so I am. Um, I'm gonna spend about a month backpacking Peru in October, and uh, I might uh, bounce around to a few other countries depending on how stable or lack thereof the government is. <laughs> you know, maybe uh, try to participate in or avoid certain uh, political actions going on down there. Uh, so you have a lot of people in the military who they join because they think they're gonna see the world, but then they never do. Uh, so whether it's when you get out or if you had the opportunity to join the reserves or just your 30 free days of leave that you, that you get, you always can't always take 30 days, but you know, post deployment you can, sometimes you could take two weeks. Uh, what, what advice would you give to these service members who, you know, the only place they've ever been is their hometown and wherever they got stationed? Well, that sounds super dumb. I, I think that's a boring person. Don't be that person. If yeah. you are that person, stop being that person and be somebody else. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have stamped out like four or five passports. Yeah. When I say stamped out, like you get X number of pages with X number of blocks that they can put a stamp in. And yeah. I get passports with the extra pages that are in there. And um, they'll even like, you can send your passport in and they'll put in extra pages and then like restaple it. Um, those passports, I have run out of st- stamp places for those. And half of those trips have been for the military. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think it's like, your own imagination and your limitation or fear of rejection to try and get an opportunity to go to some of these places. I mean, you can hop on flights for like $20 to Spain. And then once you get to Spain, you can hop on a train that will take you anywhere in Europe for like a hundred dollars, you know, and like, Oh no, you don't want it to stay in a hostel because like you're a high class E4. Cool. Um, well fine. Just be a coward and don't do anything. Um, I mean, it's literally like your own imagination and you're just having a set of balls to go do something rad. Yeah, I, um, I did the Space A flights, uh, Space Available, for those who don't know. They have military flights that go overseas, and if there's open spots, um, they rank them in categories. So if you're like on emergency leave, you're category one. If you're on uh, like military orders, like category two, active duty is three, then like reserves, dependents, uh, retirees. 
I, uh, I flew to Rota, Spain for, like you said, like 20 bucks. Yeah, so I flew back from Naples uh, for like 40 bucks, and they fed me like a king, which was awesome. And then after I got out of the military, um, like I, I went to Iceland, I went to, to Russia, I went to Cuba. Uh, this year I've done Norway, Mexico, Australia, I'm about, about to head to Peru. And a lot of people who are afraid to get out of the military don't realize that like you have the every opportunity to be successful and whatever definition of success that is for you, that's what you can obtain. If wife and kids is successful, if finance, financial freedom is successful, if starting a business or helping others, like whatever your definition of success is, you can obtain it if you work hard enough. You know, granted, you're not going to have an NCO that's telling you, you know, to get your ass out of the rack or like supervise you. And so it's on you. And yeah, per personal initiative. Yeah. And so like everybody has, you know, has different goals where, um, you know, whatever you care about is what you spend most of your time doing. So if yeah. for, you know, if woodworking is your passion, you know, that's what you spend most of your time doing and, uh, you know, whatever the case is. So you, know, you have the opportunity to, uh, to, you know, travel the world and, and see whatever you want to see. And really the only limit that is placed out there is, uh, the, the limits that you place on yourself. Everybody has their responsibilities, whether it's, you know, wife, kid, whatever. But like you said, at the end of the day, like, you know, you can put a little bit of money aside, you can put a little time aside and you can go out and take the initiative to see something you've always wanted to see instead of just like double tapping a picture of it on Instagram and being like, oh, one day I'll go. But you never do. If you uh, if you could recommend any travel destination to our, our, uh, our listeners, well, where would you recommend? Any one? Yeah, or top three, whatever comes to the top of your mind. Argentina. Because you can do so much there. You can, you know, climb the mountains of Patagonia. You can go down to the south and go to San Mateus and you can see orcas attacking penguins, you know, <laughs> and then like you can go and do like the legitimate South America thing in like rainforests with waterfalls and, and like beautiful brown or uh, blue crowned cockatiels like, ah, like flying every place. Um, so like the variety of what you can get there, the barbecue, um, the horseback riding. It's like all of it in one place. Nice. Uh, Africa. I mean, Kenya is so good. So good. Food is so good. Coffee is so good. People are super chill. Sometimes they have like revolutions. So that's fun. <laughs> Just pick up. And then the Europe. Well, I see, but I also don't want to leave South Africa out because um, that is now getting pretty Africa where it used to be so stable. It's like, you know, the most consistent tourist destination in Africa. Um, and, you, know, you can get to Kruger, you can get to the Botswana border, you can go to Limp Limpopo and see hippos, um, you know, the lions and giraffes and all of that. And then you could go cage diving out of Cape Town. You can buy some Kruger in. but now it's getting pretty unstable you know there's lots of race wars going on there and like johannesburg if you're a white person is super dangerous so uh so yeah now it's it's kind of africa so you can get the whole african ex experience there as well um and then yeah i heard you you've been to norway norway's gorgeous yeah iceland greenland um when you like want the extreme of the north yeah yeah, Germany, Austria. I don't know. There's just so many beautiful places out there. Mm -hmm. I, I have a few more places on my bucket list. Like, granted, if if I were to get popped right now, I'd be pretty, I'd be pretty satisfied with the life that I lived. Um, and I think that if you um, if you were to kind of like measure out everything that that you've done in life and your accomplishments and everything that you've done up until this point, uh, what what would you say that you're the most proud of? Oh, that's tough. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have sent that one to you earlier. Yeah. Um, see, I don't even like reading questions ahead of interviews because uh, like, I don't want to pre-prepare stuff. I think that's like disingenuous to, I would rather just like answer it what I think. If a, um, I mean, killing assholes is definitely up there on a the list. You know, it's like, oh, you don't want girls to go to school and you throw gay people off roofs, you know, and you like set people on fire inside of like Christian churches. Cool. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Um, so that's up there. Obviously being a father and like being a good father to my kids, like that's up there. Um, you know, fighting for the UFC and, um, you know, like world titles, like that's up there. Um, but 
I don't, I, I think my biggest stuff is, is coming like in the next couple of years, like I'm already working on things that are going to be pretty big things for me. So I don't know. Anything you want to plug now? Man, I'm trying, I'm trying to change the America. Yeah. You know, I'm like trying to, I'm trying to put the teeth back in what it means to be, to have individual responsibility. Um, trying to remind Americans what it means to be American. Like being American does not mean you get a free ride. Like we're talking at the beginning where it's like, it's not what I signed up for. And I, I think that's an attitude with a lot of people in the United States. It's like, Oh, I, I want free healthcare or uh, you know, like I want to move here and be able to vote people in. that are going to give me free stuff. And I was like, what it means to be an American is like, you're going to do a shit ton of work mm-hmm. that you're going to be exhausted at the end of the day. And that you are going to earn every single bit of this freedom um, that, you know, we're going to tell the government to go screw themselves, that we're not going to pay taxes, that um, nobody promised you anything besides freedom, and you got to work for that. So, you know, Sheepdog Response, um, my defensive tactics company, like, like, we're just trying to change what people's view is on, like, your own right to be able to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, like, this week alone, obviously, it's been traumatic and devastating in what it means to be an American with a few shootings in a row. And I just like, I just want the right guy or gal there with a gun. So the next time this asshole comes and there will be another asshole that they're met with a barrage of gunfire, you know? Yeah. I, um, I, I agree everything with what you said. And I, I kind of like to take it through a, a few different points. Uh, there's a book out there, you know, I'm sure you've heard of it, Starship Troopers and the, yeah, the, everybody will always say, oh, the book's better. Well, you know, books are 35 hours long. Movies are an hour and a half. So you get way more invested in books. So you know, the nerds out there, it's like, oh, the book's better. Well, no shit. You know, it's you know, 30 times longer. Uh, but the, the the principle in there is that, uh, you know, citizenship is earned in, in that, uh, that version of humanity where you're not born with certain inalienable rights. You have to earn the right to be able to vote. You have to earn the right to be able to earn uh, to you know, own property and, and stuff like that. Um, do you think that, um, that America would benefit from some sort of system put into place saying that you have to earn your, your rights once you turn 18? I, I, I just think there has to be a cultural shift where the average person looks at their citizenship as something that is earned and all of the freedoms that they have. Um, I, I just think that perception needs to change. There doesn't need to be a requirement. You know, like you need to do X to earn Y because I, I think everybody has, you know, the right to bear arms and freedom of speech. Like those are things that are like inherent and like those aren't given to you. Like you have those. Um, and you know, that's the beauty of the constitution. So like we, we should never put a price tag on, on what it means to have freedom because it's priceless. Uh, but what we do have to have is an appreciation for the cost of it. And the cost is something that no one can ever pay, you know, because uh, it's it's being paid all the time with people's blood and our forefathers' bro- blood. So, I don't know. Yeah, and um, sorry, that was a heavy, complex answer to. No, I love it. A Starship Troopers question. I mean, Starship Troopers is a very heavy, complex books with lots of moral and uh, uh, and political um, questions that are answered because it was. You know, a, a big part of it was it was written after Korea and kind of the tones that are in there was that the author was pissed that we left uh, POWs and in order to accept the armistice and, you know, the ceasefire that, you know, we didn't end up getting all of our boys home when he felt that America stood for that, you know, no matter what the cost was, like we would come get you. And that being an American knew that meant that you could you could trust you could count on your government to bring you home, whether it was alive or dead. But at the end of the day, your family would have something to lay to rest. And, yeah. and so, like, I think that, you know, the, the, uh, the, you know, the title of, of your company, you know, um, Sheepdog, uh, there's, there's a, a book called Colonel Gro- uh, On Killing by Colonel Grossman. And there's a paragraph in there where he says that, you know, most people are sheep, you know, the, the average person. And, you know, the sheepdog is kind of likened to military and law enforcement. And that the sheep don't like the sheepdog because it reminds them of the wolf, but that's who they run to when the wolf comes to call. And so the idea that, you know, you have people who are willing to do violence on, uh, on behalf of those. And I think everybody is capable of violence. Uh, if you put anybody in the right circumstance, when it comes to that, 
that you know moment where they they accept mentally that if they don't fight they will die i think everybody has the capacity for violence but some people that is their uh default setting uh, a screenplay that i'm actually working on uh right now and we're trying to figure out how to, how we want to translate this into a medium is that one of my biggest fears as a citizen who legally carries a concealed weapon is that if something happens you know whatever the case is like you know, a bad guy you know pulls his weapon out i pull my weapon out and whether i shoot him or he runs or whatever the case is now the first cop that comes around the corner sees me with a gun and assumes i'm the bad guy and he has no knowledge of what happened pri- pri- you know previously to that and i could tell him like you know i'm not the bad guy or whatever you know that that uh that peace officer's first instinct is that i'm going to be the threat because all he heard was gunshots or a commotion and now he sees me with a firearm you, you do have the the theory that i you know i agree with you that preferably if anything were bad were to happen that person would be uh, met with immediate and and uh immediate and violent uh, superior you know force or resistance that would ever try to resistance or violence that that person would try to bring to bear that he would be immediately countered with superior force now however you know the fog of war is crazy you have guys who spend you know months and years in training and pipelines and they get into firefights and shit's chaotic and like these are guys like that are professional gunfighters like you know my entire existence as an infantry marine was to you know fight and win battles and when you actually get into the shit like shit's crazy you know so now you have a bunch of civilians or you know whoever the case is who all have weapons and it's hard to kind of like um decipher who the bad guy is and who is the good guy so in your expert opinion if our listeners ever find themselves in a situation like that kind of talk themselves talk talk them through like what they should do to not only like protect the innocent you know most importantly uh you know defeat the threat but then also not to get shot by other patriots who are carrying or law enforcement who happen to show up. Yeah, we, we don't have time. Um, like <laughs> our, our level one introductory course is like 30 hours um, in a weekend. You know, it's like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And, um, and we don't even scratch the surface of the things that we're trying to teach these people. Like that's what we tell them. Like you're not good at any of the things that we just showed you. Um, you know, you worked on it for like 10 hours and you worked on that for like five hours and you worked on that for like four hours. You know, you're not good at any of this stuff. The mm-hmm. only thing that you know now is what you need to keep doing to get decent at this stuff. And even once you're decent at this stuff, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to do it when people are screaming, there's crap and vomit and bile all over the floor because there's, sure. that's what happens when people get shot. And, um, you know, it's not for everybody, but you're going to show up, you know, when, when your kid is next to you and people are screaming, like you'll do whatever it takes to protect that kid. Um, yeah, uh, that's special. I think he was a specialist, um, at the, uh, in El Paso. Yeah. In El Paso. Like those weren't even yeah. his kids. And he, like you said, he showed up like, you yeah. know, he, he did what he did. And, you know, maybe the, um, and not, you know, we don't have to pin down any answer, but I think a fair point of debate would be maybe something like that is what should be required for citizenship. Um, you know, like no matter what you have your citizenship, but you know, just like other things, like there are certain things that you're required to do. Like when you're, uh, if you want to graduate high school, you're required to, you know, pass whatever your state's physical fitness standards are or whatever that's debatable. Uh, but at some point in time, like maybe, you know, the, you know, the whatever mayor or sheriff or, you know, the governor of your state, wherever you live, maybe they should hire a company like yours to come and like, you know, teach uh, high school students or, you know, college students or community center classes that, uh, you know, this is how you should react in situations like that. I think every American should know all this stuff. And I think they should all want to volunteer to come. Yeah. You know, it's just, if, if it's a mandated thing, same with like conscription, conscri- conscripted service, you know, um, the, pe- the, the, the quality in what you get when you force people to do something compared to when they willingly do it is vastly different. Yeah. Um, I don't want any, I don't want to train anybody that doesn't want to be there. And I don't want to train anybody that has to be there as a condition to do something else. What I want is people that love freedom value human life and will do anything to protect and preserve it. Um, that personal training, everybody else can just 
kiss my ass and I don't think they should be Americans, but they still can be. And that's, that's fair. Um, and uh, to, to play devil's advocate with that, you know, we, we call World War II our greatest generation, but the majority of, uh, of the people who fought and died in those battles were, uh, were drafted. And you had that movie um, where Hacksaw Hacks, 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 Ridge. Yeah. Where, you know, the, the guy didn't want to stack bodies, but you know, he wanted to serve in another capacity and you know, as you look through the, uh, the data of like active combatants in different war, like in world war one, and I, I know some nerds going to correct me, but in world war one, like the, it was like one in 10 person would actually fire the rifle. Like the NCOs had to like pipe up and down the line and like kick people in the ass and be like, you know, like fight you animals. And, um, and then World War II, that number went up. And, you know, in Vietnam, like by the time we got to Vietnam, it was like super high. And then in, you know, OIF and OEF, like we're, we're rounding like 99%. You know, you have your onesies and twos that, you know, let their weapons get dusty and captured and get medals for it. But, <laughs> but, um, but you know, as, as you kind of like look through uh, the way that our nation is evolving, like a lot of guys didn't want to fight in World War II and they just got handed a rifle and sent overseas and, you know, when it came to that, that moment where it was either them or the enemy, you know, they, they stepped up and did the best they can. So not everybody wants to be put in a situation like that because um, the way that I feel is that, like, not everybody can do what you do. Like, if everybody could do what you do, then, you know, the, the selection process, you know, wouldn't be so exclusive. You know, it wouldn't be such an, an elite crowd, you know, such an elite club to be a part of. And, and so not everybody is predisposed to that. But I think that people can be conditioned to be more prepared, regardless of whatever their propriety towards violence is. Uh, on this, we agree. Um, that's why we have, I think by the time you get to you know, be a, a Green Beret, you're like, you volunteered a dozen times. You know, like you volunteered to join the military. You volunteered to be combat arms. You volunteered to go to selection. You got volunteered to go to airborne school. You, vol- you know, it's like, yeah. There, there's at some point like you volunteered for everything. So there, yeah. there's, there's nothing they're going to ask of you that you haven't signed up for because you asked for it all. Yeah. And so like that, that idea that, you know, you have, your, you know, your top level um, uh, violence makers who are experts at making people unalive and, but not everybody is like that. Not everybody, you know, you can have guys that, you know, score uh, 300 on their PT tests and, you know, they, they, they wash out of regular boot camp, and yeah. it's kind of like the, people have different capacities for mental and, and physical limits. You know, you've achieved more than you know, most people will ever achieve in the military and, and, and otherwise. And so if you have just kind of like an average person who's maybe not necessarily like that strong or that fast or that mentally resilient, but he wants to serve his country, he wants to be the best version of him that he can possibly be. Uh, Cause we have a lot of listeners um, that are waiting to either go into the military or they're in ROTC right now. And they get a lot of like, they're kind of like their insight into the military from us, which is unfortunate because most of what we talk about on the show is like being suicidal and cream pieing fat chicks. Um, <laughs> so if you wanted to uh, offer any sort of advice to, you know, these, these patriots who are kind of waiting in the wings to become the best version of themselves, because not everybody's going to be, you know, Tim Kennedy, Green Beret, a special force. can be. Instructor. Yeah. See, I, there, there's nothing. I'm, I'm going to have to disagree. I don't think there's anything special about me or any of the guys I worked with. Yeah. We're not smarter. We are not stronger. We are not like, like they didn't give us some serum that made us, you know, into captain America. Like, like we were not genetically predisposed for anything. <laughs> Hell, we might be dumber than most of the people listening. If not, most of us are dumber than the people listening. What yeah. we did do was like make a choice then make another choice and then make another choice, and make another choice volunteer and volunteer and volunteer. So like, don't undersell yourself. This is my advice is don't limit yourself to what you know you can do or think you can do. Cause like, what's the point of doing that? Like yeah. if I know that I can run a seven minute mile, like, but I never tried to be something I never try to run faster. What's the point? What's the point of even running? Right. Um, so never limit yourself to what you think you can do or know you can do. Just go and find out what you can do and keep going until you fail. And then when you fail, try again. That's that's, a, that's great advice. I um, I uh, I tried out for reconnaissance and uh, apparently they they want you to swim like a dolphin. I found out the hard way. I swim like a manatee, <laughs> and I uh, I did not do well. So I I um I, I got tired of getting drowned. So I just went infantry and. 
um, had a had a very had a, had a very uh, eventful career after that. And because you know, not a not not every avenue is for everybody. And so the times that you have found yourself where you've tried something and that you have failed, uh, what motivation do you have to try to find another way? Um, well, one. I, I'm, I fall into that dumb category where I, I'm, I swear to God, I'm just too stupid to quit sometimes. <laughs> uh, where like the, the absolute right decision is just to quit, but I, I just don't have that in me. Um, like I, you know, whether Sear school or Ranger school or Robin Sage or getting, you know, like your, your pre-mission train up when you know you're going to go seek out the number two most sought after terrorist on the planet and you're going to be part of that task force and you know this um like regardless of what the challenge is in front of you you know you like the onus is on you to prepare for that um and I, and so i think that the, the vast majority of failures come from the lack of preparation Yep. And lack of preparation comes down to discipline, hard work, you know, like the litany of, of the normal things that everybody hears and like the, the motivational memes, you know, like it sucks because they're true. You know, like you, you look at the, you go to my Instagram page and you're like, eh, like what an egotistical bastard. He's like saying <laughs> another thing that's supposed to be motivational. And it's like, yeah, but man, it's true. Like you just got to pick yourself up by your boots and go and try it again. You know, like I can't list, go look at my fight record. Look at all the losses that I came back and won. You know, like look at all the titles that I didn't win and I came back and won some more. Mm -hmm. You know, look at all the times I lost grappling competitions to now be like recognized, recognized as one of the best black belts in the world. You know, um, and my failures in business and my failures in the military, like they're too, they're too long to list. It's like, like life's a goddamn burpee. You know, you just get down and you get up. <laughs> you gotta get, get get back down again you know and it, then it's like god oh, this sucks but i'm gonna get back up you know it's like oh, i'm getting down again and i'm gonna get back up like that's it yep. until you die that's fair um yeah I'm, I, I wasn't anything special when i went in i wasn't particularly fast or strong i was pretty good at suffering though and <laughs> that I, is a good skill yeah yeah, and so just for being, you know, an, an average human being, I uh, I found myself being able to to do some pretty uh, remarkable things without adult supervision, which is really weird in the Marine Corps because you know they they want to be up your ass about how you blast your boots, but then to be put on like a task force where it's just like six of you somewhere and like civilians and like a in a in a POV somewhere in some Middle Eastern country, you know, like it's, it's a very uh, different Marine Corps experience than most people have. But at the end of the day, like, you know, we do need mechanics. We knew we do need, um, you know, uh, paralegals or, you know, motor T, whatever the case is. And so like at, at the end of the day, like somebody has to do those jobs. You know, not everybody uh, can be the one who kicks down a door. Not everybody, uh, you know, can be the person, you know, who goes after, you know, the, the number two terrorists or whatever the case is. And so just to kind of you know, round it back to wherever, like whatever your, your dreams or your ambitions or your goals are, you know, use Tim's philosophy of just being able to get back up and refuse to fail and find out whatever makes you happy, whatever, whatever you want to do in life, um, find that goal and just to continue to, to work for it. <laughs> Cause I, I, I can't tell you how many times where I've been sitting there just like totally soaked in rain, tired as fuck, blisters everywhere, with fucking, you know, just got out of a firefight or whatever. And I'm just like, why the fuck am I here? And then all yeah. I can think of is like, you know, my little sister's back home and just hoping that everything that I go through in life prevents them from having to go through the same hardships. So just Amen find on that. Yeah, whatever, whatever your motivation is and, you know, just, just focus on that. And one last question for you before we head out, um, and this is an also, also another question from my uh, co-host. Actually, no, I, I think one of our fans mailed this in. Um, as a special operations member, how do you feel a uh, different special operations community can uh, repair, uh, repair their image? Within the last few months, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, publicity that you know, silent professionals generally don't uh, bring upon themselves. There's been a lot of news stories and stuff like that. Um, uh, kind, of, kind of what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> you got a Green Beret like trying to smuggle 90 pounds of cocaine back from Colombia. Then you have a couple of Navy SEALs murdering a Green Beret. And you got a group of Navy SEALs raping a girl. And you got another group of Navy. It's like, um, 
Because I know like two years ago, uh, it was the Marines that were in the headlines. Like, you know, they, they pissed on a dead Taliban. They kicked a puppy I've been doing that for forever. <laughs> they, you know, one killed a, uh, a transsexual hooker. Uh, and then it was like the Navy. They were in the news. They had that kid who stowed away and like, you know, cost millions of dollars of, of manpower. They drew the sky penis, you know. They had all the... Uh, I like that one, though. Yeah, they had all the ship collisions, and it just kind of seems like this year is kind of like the 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 year of the um uh, of the uh, the silent guys not being so silent yeah. with all those instances you just listed. Yeah, I mean, you're never supposed to hear about us in the news. You know, it's, it should be like a single paragraph. On this day, these guys went and did something. Um, we don't know a lot of details, but it's pretty cool that they did. It, it. was pretty fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, um, I think. I can see Brian Gumbel saying that. I don't yeah. know what they did, but it was pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Uh, it, it, back to that entitlement thing. Uh, I, I, the, you start getting up the tip of the spear and you think you can do this, or you deserve that, or you, you, know, you, you have this liberty to do all these things. Um, you don't. You, know, you still work for the people. And the people have, even though they don't know what you're doing, and what you do is so classified, they'll never know. Um, but you should always imagine that what you're doing will be on the front page of your hometown newspaper. Your parents are going to see it. Your grandparents are going to see it. Your wife's going to see it. Your kids are going to see it. And, and where you are is a privilege to be there. You might have volunteered to be there. You might have done the toughest things in the world and had more and endured more pain than anybody could imagine enduring. But you are still a servant to the people. And, um, and you're accountable to them. So it's, we're, we're back there again, like full circle, right? Uh, yeah. What you signed up for was doing whatever they told you to do to the best of your ability. Yeah, the, I, I think that is very true. And, um, um, and oftentimes when, uh, when I say, you know, this isn't what I signed up for earlier, it was more indicative of just kind of like, I feel that when we originally entered into this war, uh, you know, we were told certain things and, uh, you know, the, the idea that you kind of had in your head of how you wanted your career to go. Cause like, I thought I was going to be the guy that to kill Osama bin Laden when I, you know, signed the dot and yeah, we all did, we all did, you know? And then I was in Jordan when that happened and I was like, fuck, you know, and then I didn't even get to Afghanistan until, you know, like nine months later. And I was like, what the fuck is even the point of me being here now? But, you know, like you said, you're there to do a job. You're there to do what's asked of you. But yeah, we just at, killed Osama Bin Laden's son this year. You know, like, yeah, yeah. there's still plenty of work to do. <laughs> I just Amen. got, like, 17 other kids. Amen to that. And it just, it kind of got to the point where a lot of guys uh, have really taken it very, very, very hard in the fact where, you know, we, we fought for cities in the early war. And then you see, like, um, al Qaim falls to, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda or saying is recaptured by the Taliban you know, these cities where, you know, a lot of our brothers and sisters laid down their lives and made that ultimate sacrifice ends up being given back to the enemy. And yeah. so now we have to recapture territory or we have to retrain forces. You know, it's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of split between, like, obviously I'm out now and I'm not going to go back in. But when I was active, I was kind of split because, like, on one hand, there's more bodies for me to slay. But at the other hand, I'm tired of having to go to memorial services. So, like, where do we kind of split the differences where, you know, we get to go kill bad guys, but that's time, like, we're not, you know, we're not losing service members, which is always going to be a price of war. Like, there's, there's just no way around it. No matter how well you try to set yourself up for success in a mission, no matter how much you plan, no matter, you know, how much you try to shape the battlefield to your will. There's it's war. There's always a chance that something can go wrong, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, um, the cost. it, it absolutely is. And so when people are like, Oh, thank you for your service. It's just like, how could they possibly know what we've been through? Yeah. You know, how, how could you possibly know the, the, the things that we've seen and the things that we've done? But, you know, I just usually say something like, Oh, well, thank you for paying taxes. And then, you know, end that interaction. I like what I do. And when people ask or say thank you for it, you know, it's like with the biggest shit and grit on my face, you know, it's like, do you, I want to sit you down and tell you what you 
paid me <laughs> to do for the past 15 years. First of all, if I could have hit a golf ball like Tiger Woods, I would have, but I can't. What I'm good at is hurting people and violence. And because I was good at that, let me tell you about all these beautiful places I got to see. Let me tell you about all this crazy ass food I got to eat. Let me yeah. tell you about this horse that I bought with like this super crooked CIA money that I rode down to the Western Sahara to bribe a warlord. You know that by bribe, I mean, I used your money that you paid taxes with to get yeah. there in the first place. And then I use that same money to pay somebody else to go kill other people. <laughs> Pretty rad. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for letting me do all this whack shit. <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's the best note to end this on. Any, uh, any closing thoughts you have? Dude, God bless America. Um, go get some training. Go buy a gun. Go exercise your freedoms. Go down to city hall with a big American flag and just start God bless America and start singing it. Say the Pledge of Allegiance every single day. Have a kick-ass cup of coffee, and um, you know, and go make out with your significant other. All right, <laughs> I fully endorse all of those things. Tim, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your insights and your wisdom. Uh, make sure to follow us on uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook, The Smoke Pit. Uh, we're available on iTunes and Spotify for those of you who are on a different platform, YouTube and Facebook as well. Also check out our website, uh, Smoke Pit, I'm sorry, uh, popsmokemedia.com. Tim, thank you very much. And um, yeah, we'll, well, we hope to, to catch up soon. We'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> take, take care. All right, bud. Be easy. All right, later.